when no one else will listen, who do I lean on? When there's no foundation stable, I go to the rock. rock I know he's able, I go to the rock. I go to the rock, rock of my salvation. Go to the stone that the builders rejected. Run to the mountain and the mountain stands by me. Earth all around me is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages, saved from all the storm that rages rich, but not from Satan's way. I'm standing on the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. Did you shoot somebody? I, I, I saw you. I heard you down there shooting somebody. You, you got to be careful about yelling shoot and, and these days. Man, we're all ducking for cover. <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's good. <laughs> it's okay. I'm glad it's just water. That, that's a blessing. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Would you all take your Bible, please, and turn to Esther, the book of Esther, just before uh, Job and Proverbs, Job's and Saul's and Proverbs, Esther chapter 8. Now, our theme for 2016 is what? Continue. Continue. We ought to be proud of that. I mean, after all, Paul Chappell copied us, and Alan Fong copied us, and uh, no, it's just one of those really cool Holy Spirit orchestrated coincidences where... Uh, we, we, we'd selected our, our theme and then found out that uh, Alan Fong had also gone with that at Harvest Baptist Church in San Leandro and Brother Chapel at Lancaster Baptist Church. I mean, it's just out of all the words and all the phrases in, in, that you could come up with out of the scriptures, that particular word, you know, three, three pastors in the same state, uh, that, that to me is pretty, pretty, pretty fun stuff. That's interesting. And I would not be surprised if it's the Holy Spirit. We get to heaven, we'll find out. He, he put that sort of thing together. And, uh, and so that is our theme. There's, we want to continue. We've talked a lot about continuing on. And, and we, you know, let's continue on in our Bible reading and continue on in our prayer. And let's continue to have a good testimony. Let's continue to witness for Christ. Let's continue, you know, to be in church. Let's continue to, to, to stay involved. And I know that this world is no friend to grace. And I know that we're all, there's all kinds of resistance, and man, it, it just seems like uh, some of it is, is physical, where you just don't feel like doing these things. You don't feel like coming to church on a Wednesday night, and you've got to overcome that, 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 that reticence. And uh, I, I don't feel like reading my Bible in the morning. I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like going soul winning. I don't feel like, you know, all these different things. I don't feel like studying it for another Sunday school lesson, and I don't feel like calling my kids and making sure they're coming to church and following up on my absentees and, and, and all those things. I understand uh, we all deal with that. That's why we need to be encouraged to continue. Uh, it's not an indefinite race. Even the longest marathon does have an end. You know, I'm sure a, an athlete in the middle of running, you know, all those miles, and, and you'll see it on the, on the back of various vehicles, they're bragging about their you know, 32, or they're, they're 16, or they're 23, you know, some, some miles or kilometers that they run. And I finally saw on the back of a car this last year, I finally saw someone who was in my league of marathon running. 
it, it, the, the mileage on the back of the car was 0, 0.0. And I thought, I thought, there's mine. Praise the Lord, I've got a like-minded person that drives that car. And that, that's my marathon. And uh, just, you know, what, I'll, I'll, as far, from here to the refrigerator and back, yeah, that's, that's about, that's about my, my, my extent. And, uh, but uh, I'm sure for those runners, and, and, and just for one school year, I, I did run cross-country. And, man, that was, I was not cut out for, for that. And it's only a couple miles, but, man, it just, oh, up, up and down, you know, through ravines and up, up steep hills and across sand and, and uh, in the back, back country, San Diego County. And, uh, man, it was just murderous. And there's some guys built for it. Man, they just go and go and go, and they seem to love it. I, I've, I hear all this talk about the second wind. I've, the, he and I have never met. You know, I just, we're just, like there's this euphor euphoria that comes on a person. They just, you know, just, oh, just all of a sudden, and, and they just supercharge. They can just run forever. And, uh, man, for me, it was just, when is that finish line coming? That's all I want to know is when's the finish coming. And then I, you know, usually one of the last ones, if not the last, to cross the line. And, uh, and but at least I got through. I'm done. Uh, but even a marathon has an end. And our race is going to end. So we, we only have to continue between now and then till either the body gives out and we're called home to heaven or uh, the Lord intervenes and takes us home to heaven or we get raptured out of here and go to heaven. But just between now and then, that's all we got to do is just stay faithful, continue on. But tonight, I want to talk to you about some things that should not continue in our lives. There are some things that should be set aside. There are some, are some things that should be left behind. And tonight, as we're holding in Esther chapter 8, you're familiar with the story, but how uh, a man named Haman came to hate the Jews, wanted to destroy the Jewish people in the Persian Empire, and particularly in the capital city of, Sh of Shushan, Shushan. And so uh, that was his goal, that was his intention and it, uh, his plot, when it was announced, uh, was uh, unknown to Haman. He, there in the, in the household of the king was a Jewish girl who had become the, the queen of Persia. And, uh, and her uncle, Mordecai, convinced her to appeal to the king on behalf of the Jewish people, which she did, and, and, and the tables were turned against Haman. And the Lord, did, Lord gave a great deliverance, and it, and it led, th led to Haman's downfall and his ultimate execution. Well, then we come into Esther chapter 8 and verse number 1. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give to the house of Haman, the Jew's enemy, unto Esther the queen. So he gave whatever belonged to Haman was given over to Esther. And it says in the second half of verse 1, And Mordecai, that's the Jewish uncle of Esther, came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. So that gained, you know, Mordecai was already looked upon as the king as something of a hero. He had uncovered a plot to, to assassinate the king, and the two would-be assassins had been executed, and the king had never rewarded Mordecai, and just recently had, you know, the Lord arranged it where the king had, had uh, learned about Mordecai, and so he's already in great favor, but now he's the uncle, or, or he's related to the queen, and so that puts him in even stronger favor and puts him in a, very, in a much higher position. We're told in verse 2, And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. So he, in essence, became like Joseph was to the Pharaoh, became, the, you know, as it were, the, 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 the prime minister. Uh, he became the actual day-to-day -day political ruler of the empire. And the second half of verse 2 says, And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So all, the, all, his, all, all Haman's assets, ironically, get turned over to his arch enemy, Mordecai. Verse number three, And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite, and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. And what that's about is, it was, it was made clear earlier in the book that you, you, don't, you don't just approach this king. You have, to have, you have to be invited. And if you go before the king, he has to show his favor by extending the royal scepter, the golden scepter, 
Otherwise, the guards are going to grab the person who's so impudent as to interrupt the king's schedule. They're going to, pull, they're going to drag him off to prison and probably put him to death. So even the queen had to have the king's permission. So the king held off the golden scepter. So in verse 4, Esther arose and stood before the king and said in verse 5, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of, of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. And if you've read through this, you know there, that Persia had 127 provinces, and letters have been sent from Haman to all those uh, governors to, on a certain day to kill the Jews. And she's looking for that now to be reversed. And what she says is this in verse 6. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? That's a tremendous change of heart from a young lady who, when first approached by Mordecai, you've got to do something. Our people are in danger. And don't just assume that because you're the queen and hidden away in the palace, that somehow you're going to be immune from, from what's happening to the rest of us. And so, it, but up to that moment, she was, she was hesitant about getting involved. She, she, she just, she'd rather just be the little woman in the background and let her husband take care of affairs of state. And she really didn't want to get involved, didn't want to get her hands dirty and all this stuff. But finally, she was convinced by her, by, by her uncle that, yes, I got to do something. And so, and now, by this point, as she's seen God move, she has a completely different heart. Now she's the one taking the initiative to approach the king and ask for a reversal of the, of the decree. And she says, how can I endure, in verse 6, how can I endure to see the evil that shall come into my people? How can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? In other words, people who are my relatives. I mean, all these people, they're, they're, they may be distant cousins, but we be brethren. We're, we're all family. Now, we have here an exa example from Esther where we have to look at the world around us. And we have to, to look at our nation. And we've got to ask ourselves, how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? We got to look at we got to look at our, our our own relatives and our own our own personal families and we got to look at our church. We got to ask ourselves, how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? There comes a point at which I just can no longer stay silent and do nothing. Now, what we must not continue, as exampled by Esther, is insensitivity. In other words. We can't be apathetic about the fate of souls. We, we, we can't, you know, how, how can I endure just to watch one by one my precious relatives die and go to hell? Or how can I stand back and, and, and watch good Christian people get so messed up in false doctrine or get sucked into, you know, this, this false praise and worship movement, the, the, the contemporary Christian movement of today? How, how can I just sit back and, and watch people uh, become, Christian people becoming more and more like the world until there's virtually no difference? And then I watch their, their kids and their grandkids certainly become the world, just never do get saved. There's no difference, and there's no gospel being preached, and there's, there's nothing there for them. And they ultimately end up dying without Christ. We must not continue insensitivity. We must have a concern for lost souls, especially of our loved ones. And I realize, just like Esther, you and I both are often hesitant about, you know, pushing too hard or going too far with it. But can I say that uh, I think everybody in your circle, your sphere of influence, deserves you to approach them at least once in your lifetime and really try to give them the gospel. And then from time to time thereafter, utilize all the little things we have in our culture whereby you can still keep the gospel going to them. And I, I mean like 
you write a card, you can include a Bible verse, or you can include a, an appeal for their soul. I mean, that, that's pretty warm and fuzzy. And if they want him, if they'll reject you over that, and, and you've been, you, you're just simply being very loving, very kind, very concerned, and they'll still shut you off, then, I mean, really, what relationship is there anyway? Uh, in, inserting a gospel tract or, or one of our many, many pamphlets that we provide here that are gospel-oriented. I realize many of them are, you know, they're not designed for salvation per se. They're, they're, they're cult, like tonight. It's a cultural issue. But I do think that there's, we have plenty of gospel literature here that on a regular basis you, you, can, you can forward something that when you respond to an email or a Facebook posting or whatever is your mode of communicating with people you love, that you, you, you just keep giving them the gospel. It doesn't have to be always a full plan of salvation, but there's an awful lot of verses in this Bible that deal with salvation. And you can just give them a verse here and there. It doesn't necessarily even have to be every single communication. But I would on a regular basis just test the waters and see how receptive they may have become over the years. But we can't just do nothing. We must have a concern for drifting saints, especially, I think, of the young people of our church, that, that we, we've, got to, we've got to love them enough to be willing to tell them the truth. And, I, and believe me, I know what it is to be absolutely shut, shot down and shut down by trying to share a, a, a concern I have for, for a young person. They're not always receptive, receptive to it, but at least I... I want to know I tried. I want to know I made an effort. And if there's a door of opportunity, I still would like once in a while just to let them know, by the way, we haven't changed. If, if you're not one of us, it's not because we shut you out. And I, and I, I, I know how they like to paint it. Like, they like to make us look like ogres. And, and we're mean and, and make them feel bad when they walk in the door. And, you know, and once again, this last Mother's Day, this last Sunday, I saw some of these young adults come in, and they were loved and welcomed and accepted, and they're wanted here. So if they have some kind of a funny feeling, and by the way, is it a strange thing that someone's not been around for months, they walk in, and someone's going to look at them and go, do I know you? And they're going to interpret that look. Look how they're judging me. You know, what they're trying to say is, I think I know your name. You haven't been around here in a long time. And for some people, it's like, so are you here to stay? And, and what am I supposed to do as a pastor? Go around and slap my members? Get that look off your face. I mean, yeah, you know, it, it's like, and I, and I don't know if someday this will, this will get posted. I don't know if it will get to the wrong ears. But, but you know, I, I, I've got, I'll simply say, a relative who, when that person comes here, you know, gives us some of the same guff. Uh, and, you know, and, and my, my thing is, look, these are people that love the family that attends this church and are heavily involved in this church, and they, and they know about the pain you've inflicted upon us. So what do you expect? They're going to be just, they're going to, you need to prove yourself. But what I do know is this, when I, even knowing that, when I watch how that person is received in this church, I see a lot of people going out of their way, crossing the auditorium to go and put on a hug and shake hands and smile and talk and ooh and ah over the, the growing children and, and, and you know just going to great lengths to make that person feel loved and welcomed. And if there's an occasional person either because, who, who are you again? I don't remember who you are. Or, or, hmm, I know how you've hurt some people that are very near and dear to me in this church, and I don't, I don't appreciate that. And, and, you know, whatever it is, or just someone who just simply doesn't even notice them. I mean, we're all coming and going, and there's been times I've walked right by people. I didn't know I wasn't shaking their hands I, or making a big fuss about them. I was just from point A to point B, and you get this much mass in motion, and it, it doesn't stop on a dime. It just plows right on through, you know, and doesn't always notice everything around it down there in that low, below six-foot level. You know, it, it just, I don't always see everything down there in those lower regions. And uh, so, but, but my point is just simply to say that, that uh, uh, I, I realize that sometimes they want to paint us bad. 
but, but we still need to love these people and go out of our way to show them our love. And from time to time, just in one way or another, urge them to come back to the old paths and, and come back into the old ways. And we must have a concern for our dying society. And if you wonder why the stuff we give out is not 100% just pure gospel, man, we have, a, we have a society that's just gone over the deep end. I mean, when it's to the point where the government wants to dictate to us how we choose to label certain rooms and take one given room and say, this is specifically set aside for the ladies of our church. This is their room so that a man can't even accidentally you know, walk in on them in, in their most delicate moment, most, most vulnerable moment. It's just known that that's a, you know, no man needs to go to that door, through that door. What right does the government have to tell us what, how we label the rooms of our church building? Or the business, or the home, or, or whatever, whatever place it is. Uh, so, but, but, but that's how far gone we've gone in a very short span of time. So, uh, and I know you're getting, mo most of us are getting our news and information pretty one-sided. So I, I feel an obligation, I feel a need, you know, to share the, the, the other side, if you will, the Christian viewpoint, conservative viewpoint, the, the way God would see it, the biblical perspective on these many issues. And I know it must get at times tiring or overwhelming. All I can say is you're only seeing a small percentage of all the stuff I'm reading. I, I just try to take the best of it and share with you. And I've got far more backlogged than I can get to you. I wish I could give you more. There's only so much I can do before I, even I feel like I'm overwhelming you. But my point is, I just have such a burden for our community, our county, our society for this nation. And I feel like somebody has got to shake the tree a little bit here. And, and, and I know you're, there are times you're thinking, well, then just, just give them the gospel. And I do try to give out the gospel. But, my, but I also believe that along the way, someone's got to speak up on all these things that are coming at us and affecting our church and our families and our kids. Someone's got to, got to, you know, got to be that voice in the wilderness. Someone's got to be that prophet speaking up and speaking out. And so I, I just, I feel a need just to keep pumping this stuff out. And anything I give to you in the church, there's extra copies going into the community. And I'd, I'd love to have about another dozen people that just, I, I just can hardly keep them supplied with enough material I mean, when, you, when you're on a, a school campus, or you're, now, and I realize you've got to be careful like at work, for example, but uh, when, when you're out going for a walk, man, let it, let it be a, a, a walk dedicated to saving America, <laughs> you know? As you walk along and uh, on the cars you pass, on the, the car windows that are left open, phew, just slide something in there for the, the person, you know, on, on people's porches, people's driveways, people's mailboxes, people's front doors, just, just you know, all over the place, bus stops and waiting rooms. and But truth going forth. We've got to be, we've got to have a concern for our dying society. Would you now please fast forward a little bit to Job chapter 8 and verse 11. Job chapter 8 and verse 11. You're, you're well familiar with Job's distress that he was going through and Satan's attack. The three friends that came to, to counsel with him and only added to his misery and Job's questioning God and I wish I could just have a chance to speak to God and, and, and understand what's happening here, why I'm going through this, what did I do? And his three friends saying, oh, you know what you did. You've kept it hidden even from us, but you know it had to be something. And they're just piling on the grief. But once in a while, those three friends did say something right. <laughs> and in this case, Bildad, who's always struck me, Bildad, in my mind, is 
kind of a Middle Eastern version of uh, what was Popeye's arch enemy? Bru Bruno. Bruno. Brutus? Man, I'm about to have a church split over Popeye. <laughs> but you, the big guy. Is always trying to beat him up? Yes. Whoever, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'm a pastor. You're all right. Yeah, if it's a non-essential, you're right. <laughs> so but you, at least you know, you have him in your head, right? You got a picture of him wanting to punch out Popeye? Uh, about three times bigger. and all. Well, that's kind of how I envision, envision Bill Dad. You know, he's, to me, he's kind of the rough, gruff, a little bit uncouth. Uh, the other guy's a little more smooth and suave and sophisticated, but, but not, not Bill Dad. I, I just don't see that in Bill Dad. But Bill Dad, I think, had something smart to say here. He may have said it to try to hurt Job, but it still had some wisdom behind it. In Job 8, verse 11, Bill Dad says, Can the rush... That, that's like a reed growing up out of, the, out of the water in a marsh. Can the rush grow up without mire? No, it needs that muddy water bank there. Can the flag, that's another kind of marshy plant, grow without water? No, no, it's going to have water. Whilst it is yet in its garment, while it is yet in its greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So when the water dries up, when the mire dries up, these plants are real fast to die. Well, verse 13, he says, so are the paths of all that do what? Forget God. They're not going against God necessarily. They simply forget God. And how many times has that been you and me? Man, we just charge off into our day and we forgot all about God. Inviting God, bringing our needs before the Lord, asking him to guide us, asking him to be filled with the Holy Spirit, putting on the whole armor of God. Well, so are the paths. We're like, we're like a rush without mire. We're like a flag without water. We're withering quickly. And in verse 13, the hypocrite's hope shall perish. And if I'm claiming to be a Christian and I'm marching down my path of life having forgotten I'm supposed to be following God. He's not supposed to be keep trying to keep up with me. I'm a hypocrite, claiming one thing, living another, and my hope is going to perish. Verse 14, whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be a spider's web. And that's a great word picture. Uh, you, you see this beautiful spider's web, and you've heard how there's more tensile strength in a spider's web than there is in steel. But at your size, compared to its size, if you try to lean on it, what's going to happen? It breaks through immediately. It just, you demolish the, 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 the web. Well, people who are trying to get through life having forgotten God, not only are they hypocrites, but they're in a bad way because they're trusting in a spider's web. Maybe they're trusting their employer. Maybe they're trusting their good credit. Maybe they're trusting world philosophies. But when they actually go to put their, it looks beautiful. It, it sure shimmers in the sunlight with the dew on it first thing in the morning. It's beautiful to behold. But when you go to put any weight on it, it breaks right through. And it says in verse 15, he shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. And the house, that's his family. He, try, he says, well, I, I, don't, I don't have a relationship with God right now like I should. And the things I try to lean on this world, they collapse under me. I know I'll lean on my house, but the house won't, can't handle that kind of pressure. Your wife, your kids. He says in verse 15, he shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. It can't handle that kind of pressure. Now here's something else we must not continue this year. We must not continue. <clears throat> Voice just went there for a second. We must not continue inattention. Say inattention. Yeah, attention where you're being very careful about minding your, your business, your walk with God, you know, crossing all your proper T's and dotting all your proper I's. But when you become inattentive, you just march on through life forgetting. Oh, I meant to read my Bible. Oh, I meant to pray. Oh, man, I, I can't believe. Here it is Friday. I forgot Thursday night soul wedding. I even forgot Wednesday night church. Oh, well, there's always next week. You know, just forgetfulness. 
And uh, it's a careless attitude about the Lord and our relationship to him. We must not continue. We've got to change that about ourselves. Get back on track. Could you turn now a little bit further to Psalm 81? Psalm 81. As you come into the Psalms, David had a concern that his people should remain in love with Jehovah like he was. And he wanted to teach them how to express their love to him freely and enthusiastically. And that's much what the Psalms are about. And you'll see it in Psalm 11, uh, Psalm 81, rather, verse 1. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. And he goes on from there, and in the intervening verses, what you learn is sin blocks the love channel. Sin, when we disobey God, it stops up the plumbing, <laughs> the spiritual plumbing. It's a blockage. And we're not able to love the Lord freely and certainly not enthusiastically. And so then he comes into verse 8 and he says, verse number 8, Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee. O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me, and that's often the key, if you'll just listen. Verse 9, There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. Now what's interesting about that phrase, the would means the collective will of the people was, we're really not interested. We're, the, you know, we, we, if we have to, if we absolutely have to, we'll go to the temple, we'll do our due diligence. But it's not because we want to. I mean, if I have to go to church just to keep my spouse off my back, if I've got to go to church just to keep my parents happy, if I've just got to go to church, you know, for whatever reason. And, and it's that kind of an attitude. But their will was not into it. They, that's not what they really wanted. Verse 12, well, God's not going to be treated that way indefinitely. He says, so I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Now, beloved, you mark down verse 12. Verse 12 means temporary high followed by a long and ever-deepening low. So what do you mean by the high? Hey, your heart's lust. When you actually get it, hoo-hoo, I got the pretty girl. I got the, I got the rich guy. I've got the big promotion. <clears throat> I, got, I got the cool car. I got some of the things I want in this life. But in the long run, you know it doesn't satisfy You've heard it from people who've been there and had it. And yet, so many Christians keep falling after the same silly wiles of the devil. It works. <laughs> Why does Satan keep doing the same thing over and over? Because it works so well. And, it, and so they, they walk in their own counsels, and that leads to disaster. Verse 13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. Lord saying, oh, imagine where they would be by now. I mean, just think about America when America was closer to God. I, I, my wife got me, no, Trisha got me a book on tape. Oh, my goodness. I did define that. He, she got me an audio book. I'll put it like that. She got me an audio book for my, my, my Mercury that still has an old cassette player in it. And uh, just listen to uh, the historian writer Ambrose writing about the Trans-Pacific, trans, uh, Pacific, the, the Transcontinental Railroad. And it was, it was really fun, as I was telling my family yesterday, I said, I, said I, I just came to the last chapter today, and it was on May 10th, 1869, that the Transcontinental Railroad was finished. They drove the Golden Stake and the, and the Golden Spike, finished the railroad, and it spanned the two oceans. And it's an amazing story. And here, and it didn't dawn on me at first that I was listening to that on May 10th. <laughs> it was just one of those cool coincidences. It was really great. And uh, so the very anniversary of the, the finishing of the railroad, I'm listening to a book about that very project. One of the greatest accomplishments. Uh, it, 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 it's up there with us going to the moon. It's up there with the computer 
and the internet. It's just one of the great accomplishments of mankind. We don't see it like that today looking back, but at the time it was a major technological accomplishment. And you know when we were doing that sort of thing? We were winning our wars and we were accomplishing great feats when we were much closer to God as a people. It's amazing that, how God favored this nation. Well, anyway, the Lord reminisces about, oh, how it could have been. Verse 14, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. That's a, that's a sobering verse in light of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Verse, thir- verse 15, the haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him but their time should have endured forever. In other words, they're saying, if you just would have submitted to me, they would still be an ever greater nation. Their, and their families would still be thriving and they'd still be going forward. Verse 16, he should have fed them also, he, the Lord, should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. Now, beloved, what we must not continue is an insurrection against God. In other words, rebelling against the Lord, disobedience to the Lord. We know what he wants. This Wednesday night crowd knows what God expects of us. It's a matter of the will. Will I submit or will I not? And right there often is the fork between a family or an individual that's going to go on to greater things with God and the one that's just going to get further and further away in a downward direction. Last scripture, please. John 6, 26. John 6, 26. As we come into John chapter 6, it's the miraculous feeding of 5,000 men that Jesus performed. A miracle so monumental that it's one of the few mentioned by all four of the gospel writers. Now, what we find, though, in John 6 is the story after the fact. Jesus is all but mobbed by these people who just got fed by him you know, first they had to track him down. He kind of got away from them. And they found him. And they mobbed him. And they all but demanded, you must, now that we know you can do this, you must feed us bread every day. Just like the manna came down from heaven under Moses, you've got to feed us. We're tired of working and slaving by the sweat of our brow for our bread. You have the power. Why would you not do this for us? Very much like Christians. God, I know you could, so why don't you? You could, in a moment, you could give me all the money I need for this, or you could take away this illness, or you could change the circumstances, or you could, t- ch- you could turn that loved one's heart back to me again. So why don't you? You know, and God operates on his agenda, not ours. <laughs> and the sooner we figure that out, the better. The more we, come into, we, we need to come in line with him, not demand him, to adjust the universe for our, our pleasure, not for, for our convenience. So these people got angry with Christ when he wasn't willing to give them what they demanded. I mean, they thought he was Bernie Sanders or something. And this is a scary development in America today, the Sanders phenomenon. All it did was revealed that the government, the, the liberal control of government education for the last 70 years or so has worked, worked in the most negative way, turned us, I mean, in the 30s, the Marxists were in the universities, you know, by the 80s, they were in the high schools, now they've got the whole system, and they're churning young people who actually believe that corporate America is evil, and that the government is there to provide for their basic necessities, And they had great-grandparents who would have been ashamed to receive a handout. And these people demand it. And it's, it's, and by the way, I'll just, I'd just like to make a quick statement. I would 10,000 times rather, rather have to deal with a corrupt corporate, you know, leader, executive, than with a, with a liberal politician. You know, what that, you know what that corrupt business leader wants? He wants my money. You know what the liberal wants? He or she wants my money, my liberty, and my life. 
They, 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 demand, they want absolute control of me. They want to come in and tell me how I label my bathrooms in my church. <laughs> anyway, don't get me off of these things, beloved. I'll be here all night. So look here, please, quickly to John 6, 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So don't try to sugarcoat it with something spiritual. What it comes down to is me doing for you what I made it very clear from the moment you lost out of the, lost out of the garden, you're to do for yourselves. Now he does say in verse 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth. That should not be your main concern is your daily bread. But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. He's saying, you people have got the wrong priorities. You're, you're thinking physical when you should be thinking spiritual as your first priority. And this is what we must not continue, and that's self-indulgence. I mean a selfishness to where everything's going to be done based upon our desires. Or we get mad and just take a walk on God and say, I'm going to take my toys and go home. I, I'm done here. No, we, we got we to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and let him supply all these things that we need. Well, in this year when we want to continue, there's some things we must not continue. We must discontinue insensitivity, inattention, insurrection, and self-indulgence. That means that we must continue to be sensitive to the plight of the lost, studious in our spiritual disciplines, steadfast in the faith, and self-sacrificial in accomplishing the duties God gives to us. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you for teaching us this tonight. We needed it. We're all tainted by the world around us. We're all tempted, and we, we need, Lord, we're tired too. And we need this reminder, and I thank you for it. Now, Lord, would you please help us to enjoy the prayer time to follow. May it be profitable. And God, we need to do it, even if nothing comes of it. We need to bow the knee before our Savior. And indeed, it is true, we have not because we ask not. So if we expect, if we do expect miracles, if we do expect your intervention, if we do expect the extraordinary, then we must ask for it and work toward it. And I pray God you help us to be faithful in that. But Lord, help us to drop those things that are counterproductive and get back to those things you ask of us because it's for our good as well as for your glory. And we thank you for what you've taught us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. What number there, brother? 275. Let's stand together and we'll sing and if you can stay for prayer, please do come see me if you need a prayer partner or, or at least find out what I'd like you and your, if you already have a prayer partner, where I'd like you to pray in the prayer sheet.
safe, prepare, please do so. Otherwise, you are dismissed. God bless you all. We love you. Thank you. Come